fire. Four days. Going for four days. For anybody to come in, or is this anybody. particular your people? Anybody. Uh huh. Because uh, a lot of times uh, your people or anybody's people have a way, but deep down in your heart, you can't do your your own way. Mm -hmm. But then you come across this other way, and it, it matches your whatever you are. So you, you're able to go with it. That's why you see a lot of Native Americans that have, have Bible studies and stuff like that, and they fall that way. Um, because a lot of our stuff is lost because the old people passed. Yes, yes, yes that's but true. Some of the old, well, my, myself, I've uh, been in it since I was born. Really? And, okay. And, and what's your name, sir? Patrick Nelson. Patrick Nelson, and what group do you associate with? Paiutes. Paiutes, uh huh. Daughter of the chairperson of the Byakushin Kokai, Masami Sayonji, and the granddaughter of Masahisa Koi, a Japanese philosopher and poet who have created the peace prayer, May Peace Prevail on Earth, and a mother of a little baby boy named Soma. <laughs> I am the deputy chairperson of Byakushin Kokai, and I am here today to speak on behalf of my mother who unfortunately couldn't fly all the way to U.S. right now due to her health, but she's fine. So I am here today to share my mother's heart and soul, which is also my passion in life. After World War II, my grandfather said it was our mission in Japan to pray for peace, not only for the peace of Japan, but for the whole world. And until the day when everyone can pray for each country and for each other, we said, let us pray on behalf of all humanity and send our daily prayers to each and every country and nations of the world. With over 20,000 members, that's what we have been doing for the past 60 years and will continue until the day when everyone can pray for each other. Right now, I feel like a woman who was a former slave. <coughs> Her name was Sojourner Truth. And for 40 years, through the 19th century, she traveled the country speaking for women's rights and for the abolition of slavery and for anything that was an injustice to a human being. And on one occasion in 1851, she attended a women's convention in Akron, Ohio. And she was the only African woman, African American woman there. And in that convention, she gave a famous speech called Ain't I a Woman? <laughs> understanding. And today, my concern in my five minutes is to say to you that it's time for us to release our fears. Yes. 
we know we don't need to allow social media to dictate to us who we should love, who we should like, who we should appreciate. Because so much comes through the airwaves that cause us to live in fear of different groups and different nationalities and different ethnic groups. But somewhere along the line, during this conference, as we started this morning, I was so glad to hear the women this morning, we must begin to really touch each other and to look beyond the color of one's skin and to really say, I know that we are one. And with that, I want you to just take somebody by the hand. I do think differently. Reach out and get a hand. <laughs> because you see, that's one thing, that's another thing that I know. And I'm going to say this with all love. Women sometimes don't appreciate other women. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We've got the women and women to appreciate each other. Sometimes women are just discriminating as men. I didn't tell you to take your hands off. How was this classical jihad narrative arrived at? It was arrived at by reading what Muslim scholars call the sword verses, the verses of the sword in the Quran. I'll just
just read one of them. There's two of them. I'll read one of them to you. When the sacred months have passed, kill the polytheists wherever you find them. Seize them, lay siege to them, and lie in wait for them in every place of ambush. And if they repent, take up the prayer, pay the poor tithe, and let them be more forgiving and merciful. So that's the famous thing you'll hear on Fox News or wherever you know, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. Actually, it doesn't say kill the unbelievers, it says kill, kill the polytheists wherever you find them. So that's my text of terror. Um, however, this. Going from that verse to what I mentioned before as the classical jihad position was quite an interpretive feat. It was a real act of gymnastics. And I'll tell you why. Because anybody, I would really, I know texts and interpretation. There is no standard meaning of a text, except we all know this. But I think if you take 99 people and you stick a copy of the Quran in front of them, translate into whatever language they speak, uh, they're going to see pretty clearly that. The, the position of the Quran regarding violence and war is not the same as the classical jihad position. It's a very different uh, position. And the position of the Quran on warfare is much better represented by two verses that I'll read you right now. And again, these are just two of many, many, many verses I could read. Permission has been given to those who fight because they have been wronged. So permission has been given for them to fight because they have been wronged. Indeed, God is most able to give them succor. Those who are driven from their homes unjustly for but saying, our Lord is God. And if God did not repel one group of people with another group, monasteries, temples, and places of kneeling where God's name is mentioned would be destroyed. Indeed, God gives aid to those who give aid to him. Indeed, God is powerful and great. You know, I, I'm standing here before you as uh, Jerusalem is in flames. And so this, this question has such relevance to me because I have friends on both sides, um, which is not really a correct way of stating it in terms of sociobiological identities. But um, people who are resisting a very intense military occupation of another people based on a socio-biological identity. And that's something that Jewish people know as well. And so as I begin to speak with you about kill them, do not spare them, show them no mercy, I have to reflect that this was the advice, it is currently the advice, um, as some uh, of my other colleagues know, that is given by the rabbis in the, in the Israeli Defense Force two soldiers who, with whom I'm in very close contact, um, soldiers, Israeli soldiers from Breaking the Silence, that there is no longer any, um, any halt to literally shooting anything that moves. And this has been backed by our tradition in the context of a state-run military occupation. So this, I cannot do this hermeneutics without witnessing the fact that I am a teacher of the Torah of nonviolence, of Shmirat Shalom, which is a relatively new uh, discipline and order in Jewish tradition of Jews um, that really came out of our association with uh, our tradition. Because as a Jewish tradition, even though many people think the Bible is violent, um, this document that was composed over a thousand year period, uh, 3,000 years ago, you know, 2,000 years ago. We are a rabbinic tradition, and I'm speaking to you as a rabbi, and the rabbis actually made a complete turn away from what they saw as the violence in the text. And this is the first time in over, in 2,000 years, that is, Jewish people have actually been faced with this question that was uh, articulated by the previous speaker, because we did not go to war. Um, very rarely, if you, very, very rarely, not really until we were accepted as citizens of states, because we were ghettoized, um, we, we had many periods of persecution. Obviously, there's a, this is in the background of, of a huge genocide um, that, that we're not, obviously not healed from. So we too, of course, we have this tradition, choose life so that you and your children can live. You know, you have before you 
uh, blessing and a curse, life and death, choose life. I have got sick of jumping into a London taxi. And when the uh, driver asks me what I do for a living, I hear this mantra recited in almost the same number of words all the time that scripture has been the cause of all the major wars in history. Religion is essentially violent. Now, I used to think that myself. Um, I, I, when I left my convent in 1969, um, I thought I wanted nothing to do with religion ever again. And uh, so beware what you hope for, because <laughs> you never know what, what might happen. Um, but we, uh, and uh, people talk about um, compassion and my work in compassion, but I'm not in compassion movement because I'm filled with love and peace and joy. I'm filled with dread and sorrow. Um, and I, I, I sincerely believe that unless now we learn to treat all peoples, whoever they are, whether we like them or not, as we would like to be treated ourselves, the world is simply not going to be a viable place. Of the universe. 
Let the word evil as a description of something real, something acting in the world, be consigned to the dustbin of history. Enjoy dressing up in scary costumes this Halloween, and then take them off at the end of the night. Evil is live spelled backwards. Evil, live, love, evolve, use the same group of letters. Let us evolve to a new way of thinking. Only love is supreme. Whether you call it by the name God, or Allah, or evolution, or some other name. Love is the key. Love wins. Not by conquering evil, but by displacing it in our hearts. When love displaces evil, we will be reclaiming the heart of our